Okay, so hello again. So now I'm going to tell you about the research that we do in my lab. And this afternoon I'll teach you so that you can go back to your own labs and do our tricks if you like. So um, from the background I gave you earlier on on real biology, the idea that we're taking from it is that, let's say, the philosophy of my lab. Um, this is one of the projects in my lab. The other project has to do more with neurons and, and uh, neuronal stuff, but we have a real project. And the, the, the philosophy behind this project is we want to understand how glia and neuron glia interactions work in development with the idea that if we can understand this, can, we, can this help us understand regeneration? And could it be that when you have an injury, um, some of the events that go on in cells, could they be a reactivation of programs that normally take place during development? Um, so normal behaviors of glia, that glia do in, the, in, in normal development, could they be triggered in response to injury? And can we um, kind of harvest those? Can we focus on those to try to see if we can promote um, regeneration? And these are the aspects I was telling you about before. So when I started uh, my lab, when I started um, trying to work on these problems, I was very inspired by Martin Ruff, and Martin Ruff uh, did a lot of work on glia in the mammalian glia. And uh, the idea that, I, that particularly caught my attention of Martin was that he, he proposed that glial cells adjust their number to the requirements of a circuit. So if you think that the wheels are the glial cells here, the more complex your circuit becomes, the more glial cells you need. Um, okay, this is just common sense, but when you think, well, in a biological system, how do glia know how to achieve this? How do they do that? And what it implies is that glia are in close interaction with neurons, who are, which are making the circuits, and that these adjustments are likely to depend, and that's what Martin Ruff uh, showed, uh, focused a lot of his research on, is that glial number is regulated, it's adjusted to neurons through two mechanisms, the control of cell survival and the control of, of proliferation. So the number of glial cells that you need are adjusting by controlling their survival. Um, so you produce more glia in excess than you really need and you eliminate the excess through apoptosis. Very much along the vein of the neurotrophic theory of the way neurons Neuronal number is controlled. Uh, so Martin Ruff proposed that also glia are produced in excess. You also eliminate the excess through apoptosis. And that glial proliferation might be um, also controlled by neurons. So depending on the state of the neurons, so depending on neuronal activity, that can promote more or less glial proliferation. And that's very important because it means that neurons can regulate their own malination, for example, by promoting both the, the survival of the glia, but also the proliferation of the glia they're going to interact. So conclusion, the number of glial cells is adjusted to the requirements of the neural circuit, and this is achieved through the control of cell survival and cell proliferation. Now, glia in turn affect the neurons, as we saw before, through maintaining neuronal survival and uh, through themselves being neural stem cells. So it's a complete feedback. Neurons and glia interact, and this is really important to maintain the circuits. So these are uh, were Martin Ruff's ideas that I started with, I was very inspired by. And um, these are some of the earlier findings from my lab when I started my lab focusing on the developmental functions of glia. So here we were not doing injury yet. And what we found is that glia are required for axon guidance, the formation of the initial neural circuits in the fly. 
And uh, uh, these are examples showing that the growth cone go, grows towards glial cells, glia visualized here with ripple, which is nuclear. They always grow the growth cone in an environment completely rich in glial cells. This is a nuclear stain, so you can't see the projections, but the projections of the glia are massive. And here again, you see the growth cone growing amongst glial cells. The glial cells are migrating ahead of the growth cones. This area here is all covered in glial projections and the axons meet over glial cells to form the first fascicle. So this is an axon guidance function. Then we found that very much along the lines that Martin Ruff had shown, and Ben Barres, and the, who worked with Martin and so on, had shown with the mammals in Drosophila 2, we found that neuron glia interactions maintain both the survival of the neurons and the glia. So we show that um, neurons produce an irregulin, just like in mammals, in Drosophila an irregulin is called vein, that maintain glial survival. And as axon guidance <coughs> proceeds, um, the glia themselves will then promote the survival of the neurons. And this was shown by another project in my lab on the neurotrophins, and also another uh, group uh, of Tapio Heino showing that also MAMF uh, in Drosophila promotes neuronal survival. <coughs> so neurons and glia maintain each other's survival, and this happens during the formation of circuits, which, again, along the vein of the neurotrophic theory, uh, means that my, the maintenance of cell survival is part of what enables cells to form appropriate connectivity patterns, appropriate circuits. And this happens both in the neurons and the glia. And the other thing that is important that happens in development is that glial proliferation is controlled by neurons and it's very carefully timed. It's, it, it happens with a specific tempo. Um, and the tempo of glial proliferation coincides with events in axons that allow the axons to be sorted into fascicles over time. So here you have the, the first growth cones growing, you have very few glial cells, they promote, the, the neurons are promoting the proliferation of the glial cells. Now you have more glial cells, the first axonal fascicle forms, then the glia divide again, and then the axons separate, the glia migrate in between the axons and the axons separate, and they separate into three different fascicles. And this profile of cell division of the glia is controlled by neurons and allows the glia to trigger the separation of, ax of axons into fascicles. So again, it's a complete neuron glia uh, communication that allows the sorting of, of axons into appropriate fascicles to, to form circuits. So glial proliferation is controlled during development and an important um, finding was that um, in development two, I won't give you all the data, I just want you to keep this in mind. Um, in development, because we're going to deal with it a lot during injury, in development, a key genes that enable the proliferation of the glia during neuron glia interactions is Prospero. So normally the glia in the embryo after the formation of the fascicle, so at the end of axon guidance that I just told you about, at the end of axon guidance, the glia normally will not divide again. That's it. However, what um, they express Prospero, and what we found is that um, although they don't divide again, they don't fully exit the cell cycle. They remain in G1. And what these data are to show is that the cells that have, the glial cells that have Prospero are in G1 and not in G0. The Prospero negative cells are in G0. And what this means is that in the cell cycle, if a cell is in G0, it means that as soon as it has a rise in cycline E levels, it will enter a space and start the cycle and go into cell division. Whereas a cell that is not in G1, a cell that has fully exited the cell cycle, you cannot provoke it to divide quickly just with cycline E. It, it might never divide or it might take a lot longer 
than you would see in this kind of experiment. So what we ask here is, why are these glia uh, prosperopositive? So if these glia normally will never divide again, why are they prosperopositive? And what we find here, what we are tracking is how the cell enters the cell cycle with uh, BRDU. So BRDU is a, a mesh phase marker. So in wild type, normally there is nothing, they're not dividing or anything. Now we overexpress cyclin E, and immediately these glial cells become BRDU positive, which means they have started S phase, which means they were in G1. If we now express, um, if we now express not only cyclin E, but also NOTCH, and NOTCH is known from other contexts to be an activator of cell division, we now see that all the glia, which normally would never divide, all the glia become BRDU positive, and they uh, express Prospero. So this tells us two things. One is that NOTCH activates Prospero, and that Prospero um, is what is enabling the glial cells to divide. Conversely, if we overexpress NOM, which is the inhibitor of NOTCH, we, um, even in the presence of cyclin E, um, not all the cells can enter the cell cycle, only these two, but uh, the majority of the glial cells cannot. And this correlates with Prospero being only present in these two cells. Why Prospero is in these two cells, we don't understand, but it's not normal. In, in the control, there would be normally six, and now we do not have six, we only have two. And in the mutants, no matter, in Prospero mutants, in the absence of Prospero, no matter how much cyclin you give them, they can, ne they can never enter the cell cycle, which means that in the absence of Prospero, they're in G0. So just keep this in mind. Prospero is enabling the glial cells to um, respond, to, to, to go into the cell cycle, so it's maintaining the cells in G1. And this will become important in injury. So the first uh, glimpse that there was something meaningful here came from an experiment in the embryo that my student Rachel Griffiths carried out, which was to ablate neurons with ricin. And what, we, what she observed is that when she eliminated neurons, there were two phenotypes. One is in the early um, embryos, we had fewer glia, and this was consistent with the other data showing that glial proliferation during development is sequential and it happens as the axons get sorted into fascicles and that the neurons are triggering the proliferation of the glia. But interestingly, in a small number of cases, she found that there were many more prospero uh, positive glial cells. So somehow, a neuronal ablation, which is the equivalent of an injury, was increasing glial proliferation. And that's an observation that we found quite interesting at that time. So if you remember what I told you before, um, the NG2 glia, which are the OPC progenitors, which are the ones that are normally in contact with axons, respond to injury by proliferating and undergoing spontaneous axonal re -enrapment. So um, the response of the NG2 glia, as I was saying before, is regenerative because uh, contrary to the formation of a scar or clearing of debris, because what goes on is that this glia cell type, the remaining ones that don't die through the injury, will um, proliferate to re enwrap the axons. And this leads to some recovery of function. So this is what caught us our attention, and what is not known, as I was mentioning, is whether it's simply remalination or whether it's more complex and somehow is regenerative because it also invokes other functions of NG2 glia, which could be that they might be progenitors for other cell types, like astrocytes or neurons upon injury, or they might be due to the, fu the, the functions they have in relationship to neurons. <coughs> what was important to us is first show that it happens in mammals. But what we found even more intriguing is that this glial regenerative response is found across the animals. It was observed in the cockroach in the 80s by Smith and Treherne. It's been found in fish, in mice, 
in humans, and we were seeing it in Drosophila. Other uh, responses of glia are not so conserved, like for example, other animals don't form an astrocytic uh, glial scar. We have no evidence that there is a scar in flies, there is no scar in fish, there is no scar in embryos or, or larvae um, either. So the, the regenerative response of neuropal glia, of glia that are in contact with axons, is evolutionarily conserved. And this is what caught our attention. So after Rachel's observation, she was a PhD student, Kentaro Kato um, contacted me and he had done a postdoc with Keito and they had done injuries in the adult brain where they had found that stabbing injury in the adult brain induced glial proliferation and that that uh, response depended on the TNF pathway. Now, this was another evidence that the regenerative response was present um, uh, was evolutionarily conserved, present in Drosophila, not only in the embryo that we had shown with Rachel that Notch and Prospero were involved, but Kentaro had also seen that there was something similar in the adult brain and that involved TNF. So why, this is, uh, why is it so important? Because um, as I was saying before, transplantations of olfactory in sheathing glia even from uh, the end of the 80s, 1990, originally discovered by Ramon Cueto, um, was, ex was very regenerative. So transplantations of olfactory and sheathing glia led to recovery of behavior in animal models. And this has been reproduced also by transplantations in humans and transplantations of uh, stem cells and uh, NG2 glia. So the question is, what is going on? Is it simply remalination? Is it that these glial cells are providing trophic support for neurons? So do they maintain the survival of neurons, which we know they do? Are they also gaining, gay, aiding axonal navigation? Or even could they be promoting a neurogenesis, so the formation of new neurons uh, upon injury? So this is the framework in which we are investigating these events. And what we are going, what the data I'm going to tell you about today is um, the regeneration of the glial themselves, which um, is known in the, mammal, in the mammalian community as remalination. And what it is, is the restoration of glial cells, the glial regeneration. Now, for us as Rosophilists, what we found is that um, if injury provokes a glial regenerative response, in cockroach, flies, fish, mice, humans. It's evolutionarily conserved. It's found in, in, in the same profile, so it, it, um, induction of proliferation, reenrapment, recovery of some limited function. To us, what it, mean, what it meant is that there must be a genetic mechanism. If, if this is evolutionarily conserved, there must be genes that are helping this uh, take place. And if there is a genetic mechanism, we can find it, we can tackle it with Drosophila. So um, this is what we started doing with Drosophila. So what Kentaro, who came to do a postdoc with me, um, start, started setting up in the lab was to do an injury in the larva. And we did it in the larva because we thought we could address some questions more easily than in the adult in the nerve cord. And the larva is an animal of its own route, right? It has a fully functional nervous system, it crawls about, it moves, it does learning and everything. So what he did at the time was dissect the nerve cord of the larva, and this is what you're going to do this evening, and then stab the nerve cord with a needle. And then just culture the nerve cord for as long as you need, depending on the question. Um, and what he found um, was that the stabbing lesion first expands and then shrinks. To tell you the truth, when I saw this, I just couldn't believe it because I think it's amazing, right? So you have an injury. So this is, the axons are labeled with GFP and you have an injury, you see black, and then the injury first expands and then it starts shrinking. And what I found incredible is that it shrinks. So if it shrinks, it means whatever it is, there is a repair response there in the nervous system of the fly. And if, it, and if it's there in the fly, we can get at the genes. And this profile of wound expansion and then shrinkage is also found in mammals. This expansion is conserved through the mammals. So
So what these natural, this is a time lapse moving from zero to 15 hours, and what this profile corresponds to that I'll be showing you as we go through the lecture is to the repair and regenerative responses that are taking up, taking place as the debris gets cleared and the glia proliferate. This is the intact nerve cord after the injury. It's a stabbing injury, so what you see is massive cell loss at the beginning of the injury. And what you see when you do, so here the, the axons are in green with GFP, the glia are with uh, GS2. And the, the, what you see is a hole that comes dorsally where Kentaro stabbed, and a hole that goes ventrally, either because he reached all the way down or because there is a reaction of the tissue. Um, and you see massive cell loss originally. Then he looked under TM, and this is the normal uh, nerve cord of the larva under uh, TM, and what you see is that you have here the neuropile. The glial cells are all outside, so the nuclei of the glia uh, sit outside the neuropile, and they, send, they have projections enwrapping all the neuropile, and then they have projections that go into the neuropile, and these projections enwrap axons in two ways. They enwrap the bigger axons individually. As you can see, all this black, black, black is glial coverage. And the smaller axons, they enwrap them in clusters, a bit like the Rimac glia in mammals. When you have an injury, first you have these vacuoles forming that we think are probably full of liquid. And they're very, um, they happen in mammals too. In mammals, they're called cavitation, and they're very typical of brain and central nervous system injury. And then you see the, the glia uh, expand massively. You have very intricate and large glial projections that you see here in black. And these glial projections do two things. One is they envelop these vacuoles, and eventually they dissolve them. And they engulf all this cellular debris that results from the injury. So they, they become phagocytic, and they're full of these apoptotic cells, bits of cells that, re, that resulted from the injury. Here, um, what Kentaro has done is a time lapse, and what um, this is now the nerve cord, and um, I mean, it wasn't the nerve cord before, again, I mean, confocal. And what uh, we're seeing now is the axons in green, the glia in uh, pink, and the with DS red. And we think these are probably equivalent to the vacuoles that we were seeing in TM. And what in TM I was showing you that they're totally surrounded by glial cells. And what you see in time lapse is that these holes in the neuropi, at the beginning of the injury, they're holes, then over time, we see them get filled up with glial processes that you can see here with DS red. And eventually, <coughs> the, glia, the, the holes disappear. <coughs> and we think this, what, what it means is that the glial cells are enveloping, invading these vacuoles, and dissolving them. So that's part of our repair response. What um, we see here is the regenerative response, so the proliferation of these neuropal-associated glial cells in response to injury. So normally, so we have, with ebony, we're seeing here the neuropal glia. Normally, uh, these glia don't divide in wild type. As I was telling you before, they are quiescent after axon guidance. You never see them divide, but they are in G1. And uh, here you see the site of injury, and what this means is that when you have an injury, this triggers the proliferation of all these glial cells which are surrounding, surrounding the injury. So that means that by the glia, by being in G1, they were able to quickly induce proliferation in response to an injury. So it's as if the glia kind of repair cells that normally are not doing much in terms of cell division, they're doing other things, but the minute you have an alteration, uh, like an injury, they can divide. And we see here with BRDU, and as well as BRDU, we can count it. So we see that upon injury, we have an increase in glial number, provoked by the proliferation. 
And this is uh, the number of repo-positive cells. So we have, we've counted them with a glial marker repo, which is nuclear. And we use a program called the DZ to count cells that I will show you later this afternoon how it works. And we know it's glial proliferation because apart from increasing glial number, we can bro block proliferation with retin retinoblastoma. It's called in flies retinoblastoma protein factor. And that prevents the proliferation in response to injury. So um, next, what um, we did was we knew from development that um, Prospero and Notch were present in the glia and enabled them to stay in G1. And staying in G1 was necessary <coughs> for proliferation in response to injury. We knew from Kentaro's previous work in the adult that the TNF pathway, which in Drosophila the TNF receptor is Wengen, um, was most likely involved, at least in the adult was. And we knew from mammals that the TNF receptor pathway could control oligodendrocyte progenitor proliferation via nf kappa -B. Although in mammals, the link to injury had not been made. But in Drosophila, we had the TNF receptor, and the nf kappa -B homologue in Drosophila, one of them is called dorsal. So then we took all these uh, genetic backgrounds. So NOM is like notch loss of function, inhibitor of notch, prosperous mutants, Wengen mutants, and dorsal mutants. Kentaro did the injury in all, measured the regenerative response. So whether you have an increase in proliferation, uh, this is the control, the, the normal control, and the retinoblastoma control, where you block the response. And he found that in all these mutants, the response is similar to retinoblastoma, which means that in all these mutants, the glial regenerative response cannot take place, which told us that these genes are involved. So I'll give you the take home message first, because this is uh, heavy genetic data coming. Um, so the, the take home message is the following. These neuropalglia normally don't divide, but they are maintained kind of quiescent in G1, which means they don't exit the cell cycle. They are there kind of resting, waiting for things to happen. And they are able to stay in this state because they have active both notch and prospero. They are notch positive and prospero positive. Notch is an activator of cell proliferation and prospero is an inhibitor of cell proliferation. And because they maintain each other, but they have opposite effects on the cell cycle, Glial cells cannot do anything. They cannot divide. They stay put in G1. Now, um, the other thing that Prospero does is, on one hand, it promotes glial differentiation markers, and on the other, it activates the expression of NF kappa B. Now, N because Prospero is a transcription factor. Now, NF kappa B normally is inactive in the cytoplasm. Um, so after Prospero activates its expression, it's in the cytoplasm and nothing happens. Now, when you have an injury, two things happen. One is um, it activates the expression of notch, but more importantly, it activates the translocation of nf -kappa b to the nucleus via the TNF pathway. Now, both nf -kappa b and notch are activators of the cell cycle. Uh, they promote cell proliferation. So as a consequence of the increased levels of nf -kappa b in the nucleus and, and notch intracellular in the nucleus, the glial cells now divide. Now, these two factors, nf -kappa b and notch, they also activate the expression of prospero because they are transcription factors. So the prospero levels over time go up. So as prospero goes up, Prospero inhibits proliferation, so glia stop dividing, and Prospero activates cell differentiation, glial differentiation markers. So you stop the, the, the proliferative response, you promote differentiation, and Prospero also activates the expression of notch, restoring the G1 state back again so that glia can respond to next injury signals. And it also triggers the expression of nf -kappa b which goes to the, to the cytoplasm, again, ready to respond to further, further injury. And this is very important because what it means is that it's a homeostatic mechanism that allows one round of cell proliferation, but not continuous cell proliferation, and that quiescence and repair is restored. 
So here we're showing that, I'm going to show you some of the data uh, now. Here we're showing that in Prospero mutants, uh, notch signaling goes down, and that when you activate notch, Prospero goes up. So this means that Prospero and notch activate each other. As I was saying, NOTCH is an activator of the cell cycle and PROSPERO is an inhibitor of, of the cell cycle. And you can also test this with genetics. So here we have uh, the number of glial cells in the nerve code stained with repo and count with the DZ, this program that we have developed and I'm going to show you this afternoon. So these, the number of glial cells here are counted automatically throughout the central nervous system from a confocal stack in 3D uh, in less than a minute. And this is in wild type. In Prospero mutant, there, is much, there isn't much of a difference. When you overexpress notch, there is an increase in glial number. When you overexpress notch in a Prospero mutant background, there is a massive increase in glial number and in ventral nerve size. So this means that notch and Prospero have opposite functions on the cell cycle. And when you remove the inhibitor, when Prospero is normally inhibiting cell proliferation, when you remove Prospero and you activate the cell cycle with notch, glia uh, go crazy, they divide a lot. So this means that notch is trying to tell glia to divide, and Prospero is trying to tell glia to stop dividing and differentiate. So here, this was a heroic experiment by um, Kentaro, um, where he shows a clone of glial cells um, showing the, this is uh, two glial cells here with their massive projections in wild type and here in a Prospero mutant where you can see that the glia don't differentiate. The morphology is just uh, totally apparent. And this was heroic because normally these glial cells don't, di don't divide in the larva. And uh, we were trying to see what the features would be for a Prospero mutant in the larva. So he dissected something like 1,000 nerve cores and stained them and everything for each of these experiments. So this was the conclusion. Normally, in the normal um, glia, Notch and Prospero maintain each other, but they have opposite instructions on the cell cycle. Notch tries to activate, Notch to repress, but because they maintain each other, the glia don't divide. Instead, they stay quiescent in G1, but they don't exit the cell cycle fully either, which means they are ready to divide. As soon as you have some signal that comes from injury, they are ready to divide. Then he showed that this response also involves the TNF pathway and NF-kappa-B, and what he's looking here is at dorsal, one of the NF-kappa-B homologs in flies, so in the wild-type uninjured uh, nerve code, he sees dorsal cytoplasmic in some of these neuropygia. When he does an injury, he can see nuclear translocation of dorsal next to the injury, so here is the wound. And this depends on Iger, because in an Iger mute, Iger is the TNF alpha homolog in flies, because in the absence of Iger, um, dorsal is not internalized into the nucleus. Um, we used also genetics to test that tors, dorsal, or to find out that dorsal functioned in a similar way to notch. So dorsal was promoting cisalco uh, entry and antagonizing prospero function. And this is the same kind of experiment as we did for notch, where you activate dorsal. We, we need to use a trick because dorsal is normally cytoplasmic and to activate it, you have to provoke the nuclear translocation. We overexpress TRAF2, that provokes the nuclear translocation of dorsal, and if you do that in a Prospero mutant background, you have an increase in glial number compared to wild type, which tells you that dorsal antagonizes Prospero. So Prospero inhibits cell cycle entry, dorsal promotes cell cycle entry. So what happens uh, during injury is that um, Iger, which is TNF, through Wengen, which is the TNF receptor, they provoke, the, they are released, Iger is released in injury, they provoke the nuclear translocation of NF-kappa-B that now promotes cell proliferation. 
So um, the reason glia can do this via Iger is because Prospero, which is a transcription factor, regulates the expression of dorsal. So here you have a Prospero mutant. The glia are visualized um, in magenta with ebony, which are the neuropile glia, and uh, in green is dorsal. Ebony is a downstream target of Prospero. So in Prospero mutants, you lose both ebony and dorsal. So this means that the expression of dorsal depends on Prospero. So what Prospero allows is that dorsal might be present in the cytoplasm, inactive, but enabling the glia to be ready to respond to injury. So kind of priming them to a response to injury. And when you have an injury, then the, the glia can internalize into the nucleus. Now, um, the question is, this is all very well, but as we said before, it's important that repair or regeneration are such and don't become tumors. So if you have a, a proliferative response in injury, it's important that this response is contained, because otherwise, if cells carry on proliferating, you end up with a tumor, not with regeneration. So how do cells know when to stop? And one of the mechanisms is that dorsal, which is a transcription factor, in turn activates the expression of Prospero. And Prospero inhibits cell proliferation. And this increase in Prospero levels, as I showed in the summary at the beginning, is really important to stop the repair response, the regenerative response, and restore the original uh, quiescence. And this is uh, one of the data sets that show that um, Prospero depends on dorsal. So again, here we um, look at uh, the activation of dorsal uh, using uh, DTRAF2. So uh, by expressing DTRAF2, we promote the translocation of dorsal. And we use a hypomorphic Prospero mutant background where we have some Prospero cells, they don't all disappear. Because this hypomorphic um, allows us to modulate the levels of Prospero. You couldn't do it with an all. So what we found is that in the hypomorphic mutant, we only have a few Prospero positive cells, but these increase dramatically when we activate dorsal in this same background. So we have an increase in the number of Prospero glia and an increase in Prospero levels. So this means that dorsal activates Prospero. Now, um, this response is uh, not only promotes glial proliferation, but it's regenerative. And we could see this in a variety of ways. One is that through TM, so um, showing that normally, as I was saying, the uh, axons are enwrapped by glial projections, which are here in black. Um, if you overexpress notch, you have more glial cells and you have more glial membrane. So the enwrapment of axons becomes kind of massive. You have a lot more glial membrane in between the axons. Whereas if you even do this in a prospero mutant background, you lose the enwrapment completely. So all of these axons here are naked. They are not <coughs> enwrapped at all. So this means that you need the interaction between Prospero and Notch, and you need especially Prospero to promote axonal enwrapment. And here is another example showing that um, um, this uh, interaction between Notch and Prospero is required to maintain uh, cell survival. Um, and the maintenance of cell survival also enables um, uh, regeneration and repair after injury. So here we show the number of apoptotic cells stained with caspase and counted automatically with the disease that you'll see this afternoon. And we have that upon injury, you have a massive increase in apoptosis, which is quite natural because we just stopped the nerve cord. So you have a massive injury there with lots of apoptosis. And when we overexpress notch intra and do an injury. There is a dramatic inhibition of injury-induced apoptosis. 
So uh, there is something about the glia. So with not intra, you remember we have masses of glia. So um, when you have more glial cells, it's either the fact that you have more glial cells or it's not itself, they are pro uh, promoting the survival of, um, uh, you, you're promoting cell survival. So they're inhibiting the apoptosis normally caused by, by the injury. So it could be a trophic factor produced by the glia because you have many more glia, could be notch function. Something in the glia is promoting, is inhibiting um, up injury in the osteopoptosis. Now, interestingly, it does not rescue naturally occurring, naturally occurring cell death in the non-injured samples. It's the injury in the osteopoptosis, which is interesting. So here, um, uh, Kentaro did time-lapse movies uh, for up to 22 hours, where he does the injury in the larva and then looks at the progression of the lesion and see this Oh, this one there. Yeah, so what's the logic? <laughs> There's no logic. No. So what he um, sees is that in wild type, the injury follows this progression. This is a later movie where what I'm showing you here is that over time, so the lesion, the wall tape is black, the lesion first increases in size and then shrinks. So this is the natural tendency to repair. Now, if you overexpress Prospero, which blocks proliferation, so it blocks the regenerative response, you have all the population of the injury, which is no mites, okay? But the injury never shrinks. So you, this is the Prospero, the injury never goes back to the wild type level. So if you block proliferation, the injury cannot repair. And when we express notch, it's amazing because first of all, the injury does not expand and then the recovery is just complete. So this, this is the profile of notch. They don't expand and they just recover fully. So as, as we go back in the data I showed you before, uh, Multiple things are happening with notch. One is we have a lot of glia, more than in the normal glial response, so more than an injury in wild type. With notch, we have a lot of glia. We have much better embrapment. And uh, we have um, protection against injury-induced apoptosis, so we have more cell survival. So if you put all of this together, I mean, a lot is going on there. It's not just glial proliferation. A lot is going on there. But it not was before, no? Before? The, the function. Here, yes. So this is genetic. So this, um, this is ripogal 4 UES notch intra. It's constantly there. So it's, pro, it's doing something to the cellular environment that, that cells like a lot. So this is the summary again. Shall I just go quickly or shall I move on? Yeah. Anyway, Notch and Prospero maintain each other, maintain the glia in G1. Normally they don't divide. They divide in injury triggered by NF-kappa-B, PNF receptor. Prospero goes up and it stops cell division so it doesn't become a tumor, so that it's true just repair. And so it restores quiescence and restores the levels of Notch going back to G1 and the levels of NF-kappa-B enabling further responses. So then we collaborated with mammalian people because we wanted to know, so what about, um, this is fine for flies, but what about mammals, have we got, sent, uh, can we make a link? And what we knew from mammals is that OPCs divide upon injury, so these are NG2B, OPCs divide upon injury, and the key challenge was that they divide upon injury, there are plenty there to trigger full remyelination, but the problem is that they don't all differentiate into enwrapping oligodendrocytes. So the question is how to promote the differentiations of OPCs into OLs so that you have functional remyelination and recovery of function. And what we knew when we started was that uh, from literature that upon injury it was known that there wasn't a upregulation of notch and this was similar to what we were seeing in the fly. So we thought, okay, so there is an upregulation of notch in OPCs upon injury, so what about the Prospero homolog? Where is PROX1? And what we found is that, intriguingly, PROX1 is in NG2 cells and much higher levels in OLs. Now, 
PROX1 is also thought to inhibit cell proliferation in mammals. And what uh, Kentaro did, so this was in collaboration with a lab in Birmingham of Anne Logan, mammalian lab, and with a lab in Riken of uh, Fumio Matsutsaki. And what Kentaro with Fumio's lab did is look at PROX1 no conditional knockout mice in the oligodendrocyte cell lineage. And he found that in PROX1 knockout mice, there are fewer oligos and there are more ng glia, more OPCs. So what this meant is that just like in flies, in the mouse, PROX1 was inhibiting OPC proliferation and promoting oligo differentiation, just like in flies. And the interesting thing is that PROX1 was originally in OPCs in lower levels, and then the levels of PROX1 increase as they differentiate into OLs. So this told us that in the mouse, the relationship between notch and PROX is the same that we found in the flies. And in the OPCs, as the levels of PROX1 increase, the OPC becomes an OL and it differentiates fully into an oligodendrocyte. So PROX1 is enabling oligodendrocyte proliferation. So this was very nice and it actually fitted very well with a high throughput analysis uh, done by the Paris lab where they did a transcriptomic analysis of oligos, astrocytes, OPCs and neurons and see what genes they express. And what they found is that PROX1, fitting very well with our data, PROX1 is expressed in very high levels in oligodendrocytes and it's present in lower levels in OPCs but it's not expressed in astrocytes. So this fitted very well with our data. Now this brought another question, which was that OPCs are NG2 glia, They're the same thing. And NG2 had been shown in the meantime to be very important for OPC development and for OPC proliferation, so that the NG2 gene itself was involved in um, OPC cell division, and it was also involved in the regenerative response of OPCs upon injury, so that the increase in glial proliferation upon injury required the NG2 gene. But it was not known what link NG2 might have to any other gene involved in injury, like to notch or any other gene. So the, the observation was, is there of NG2, but it was not known, how does it link to everything else to do to other genes known to be involved in injury, like notch. So then for that, we left the mouse and we went back to the fly because the fly is great for genetics. And the fly has a, a homologue of NG2 called Contiki. And uh, uh, the structure is the same kind of protein. It has all the right uh, components and it interacts intracellularly with the same factors. And they are both thought, but uh, hasn't been fully proved, but they are both thought that they might have different functions at different time points. They could be cleaved, as I said before, to release an extracellular domain, and they could be cleaved to release an intracellular domain that would be translocated to the nucleus and function as a transcription factor. So then we looked at Contiki in the glia and in injury. And uh, this was work done by two postdocs, Maria Lozada Perez and Neil Harrison. And uh, what uh, Maria found is that Contiki is uh, expressed in glia, in the embryo, as they divide, and with an antibody that didn't work brilliantly, but she could just about see that Contiki was also in the larval glia at um, not very high levels, but it was there. And Neil doing, doing QPCRs found that the levels of Contiki change, and that Contiki is predominantly expressed in glia because the levels of Contiki go down, particularly when he knocks it down in glia. So, in fact, um, if you knock down Contiki specifically in the glia, you have a reduction in the number of repo-positive cells. You have a loss in uh, glial cells. Here again, repo, glial cells are visualized with anti-repo, which is nuclear, counted automatically with the DZ, which you'll see this afternoon, um, which allows us to count lots of genotypes, huge sample sizes, um, 
in not a long time. So you're counting lots of cells here. And uh, conversely, when you overexpress Contiki, you have more glial cells. So this suggested that Contiki regulates glial proliferation, which Maria could see with BRDU incorporation. So here she's looking at BRDU colocalization with um, the neuropyglia marker Ebony. So um, Contiki promotes cell proliferation, glial proliferation. Then we looked at the relationship to Notch and Prospero. So here uh, we're looking at Contiki mRNA levels. They go down in Notch mutants. They go up when you overexpress Notch. So that means that Notch activates Contiki. When you overexpress Contiki, you downregulate suppressor of Herles, like that, which is the reporter of Notch. So that means that Contiki represses Notch. So what's going on is that normally Notch can activate Contiki. Contiki promotes cell proliferation. But then Contiki has a negative feedback loop that switches notch off. And this is really important, especially in the context of regeneration, because it means that there is this negative feedback restores homeostasis so that you don't carry on dividing to form a tumor. Then we ask what is the relationship to Prospero. So here we look at Prospero levels when we knock down Contiki and we have a loss of Prospero Gia compared to the control. Um, and um, here we overexpress um, Contiki, and we see an increase in the number of Prospero positive cells. So this means that Contiki activates Prospero. Conversely, here we're looking at Contiki mRNA levels. No effect in Prospero loss of function, but when we overexpress Prospero, we have a reduction in Contiki levels. So this means that Prospero inhibits Contiki. So what's happening here is that Contiki, as I told you, can promote glial proliferation. I don't have to sh time to show you all of this, but Contiki can also promote the onset of glial differentiation markers. Now Contiki activates Prospero, and Prospero inhibits Contiki. So this is a negative feedback loop that is shutting off Contiki. And this is very important because it means that um, it's a homeostatic sh shut off so that Contiki cannot carry on promoting cell proliferation. Otherwise, you would end up with a tumor. So then Maria established a new injury paradigm, a new injury method that I will also show you this afternoon. And the reason was two. First, the referees with Kentaro's paper told us the problem with dissecting the ventral nerve cord before you do an injury is that dissecting the ventral nerve cord is in itself an injury. And although that is true, uh, we could always argue, all right, yes, but then we have our stabbing of the dissected nerve cord, and you have all the experiments controlled, so what you're controlling for is what happened after injury, not from the dissection. Having said that, as you will experience uh, this afternoon or later in, in your labs when you try it, it's quite a difficult technique. The, the, the stabbing is not difficult. What's difficult is to get good solid data because you can get infections and the, the, the nerve cord can degrade. So then, uh, when Maria started as a postdoc in my lab, we said, okay, let's do another method that also reproduces better what happens in real life, which is that you don't get your brain dissected and then damaged, it's that you get crushed in an injury, uh, yeah, fully, wholly. So then we thought, we want to mimic more a real injury, a real accident, which happens in the whole animal. So what Maria uh, set up was a pinching injury, which we call crush injury, similar to a current accident, where she crushes, and you try this afternoon, the nerve cord with forceps. So that is it. And then you crush the nerve cord as best you can. This is what you hope to see. So this is the intact nerve cord. This is after a crush injury. You let the larva rest for a bit and hope it survives and look at it at whatever time point, depending on the question you're asking. And first, we validated this injury and asked, does it undergo a, a regenerative response like all other injuries that we have spoken about before? And what we find is that the profile is the same as before. You have an expansion of the lesion and then uh, a shrinkage. And here it's visualized uh, outlining the injury and here uh, pulling all the samples. 
And Maria also showed all the other features, like the uh, changing in glial shape, invasion of the vacuoles by glial processes, and induction of glial proliferation. So an injury regenerative, uh, glial regenerative response does take place with crush injury. So then we asked, what about Quantiki? Is it doing anything here? And what Maria found is that upon injury, Quantiki levels go up specifically in the neuropile glia. So Quantiki is re responding to injury. Here, this is with antibodies. This is with mRNA. So Quantiki levels first go up, and then they start going down, which you would expect, because this is a homeostatic response. And these increase in Quantiki, Quantiki levels depend on notch. So notch is regulating this response. And then she looked at the progression of injury in Quantiki loss and gain of function condition. So here is the normal profile. The injury expands and then shrinks. When in Quantiki loss of function, so when you knock down Quantiki with RNAi, the injury expands and doesn't quite shrink. When you overexpress Quantiki, you have much higher Quantiki levels than normal. The injury does not expand and shrinks remarkably very similar to what we saw with Notch. So this is what we think is happening. In the normal glia, the no, in the normal larva, intact, no injury, these neuropile glia don't divide. There is no contiki, the levels are really low, so there's virtually no contiki, let's say contiki is off, but these glia cells have Notch and Prospero. Notch and Prospero maintain each other, they have opposite instructions to the cell cycle, which not tries to activate, Prospero to repress, which means these glial cells don't divide, but they remain in G1. So they're quiescent, kind of ready to divide. Prospero activates the expression of NF-kappa B, which is inactive in the cytoplasm. So these glial cells are normally quiescent, going about their glial things, but they don't divide. In an injury, TNF is released, triggers through TNF receptor, the nuclear translocation of NF-kappa B, probably an upregulation of notch, and these together switch on Contiki, and the levels of Contiki <coughs> go up dramatically. Contiki and these two as well promote cell proliferation, so you have an increase in cell number, changes in cell shape, and increase in glial markers, glial differentiation onset. Now Contiki also activates Prospero and inhibits notch. And by doing these two things, it kicks off negative feedback. It switches, um, it represses notch, which means because Contiki depends on notch, it's stopping um, the increase in Contiki, so it's stopping proliferation. And because it activates Prospero, and Prospero inhibits proliferation, Prospero, on top of that, inhibits Contiki. Together, these switch off proliferation. You switch off notch, you activate Prospero, and you switch off Contiki. Essentially, you switch off proliferation. And Prospero now directly regulates glial differentiation markers. So this means that this is homeostatic. It's a homeostatic switch off, which restores the initial condition. Contiki off, this on, and the cells are now ready to respond to injury again. What we have shown using genetics is that if you interfere between the relationships of notch, pros, Contiki, and with kappa B, you end up with overgrowth of the nerve cord. You end up with glial tumors rather than repair. What we showed in mammals is that this mechanism is conserved. And if you compare the fly with the mouse, what you see is that in the injury, you have first an expansion of the injury, which corresponds to all the massive cell deaths. And the injury triggers the proliferation of uh, neuropagia, OPCs, the activation of Contiki and G2, Notch, and this is followed by a shrinkage of the injury, the activation of Prospero and Prox1 that lead to glial differentiation and entrapment. So this is what we think is happening, that during injury you have mechanisms that are normally involved in development, as I showed at the beginning, that are normally activated upon injury. And this is Important because for a fly, so this if this mechanism is evolutionarily conserved, most likely it's not because of its function in injury, because a fly 
doesn't make a lot of sense for a fly who has an injury to then survive, and it's already laid loads of eggs anyway. So uh, evolutionarily, it makes much more sense if it's conserved because this is actually a normal mechanism that operates in development or operates to maintain structural homeostasis throughout the life of the animal, to maintain the structural integrity of the nervous system. And it's just reactivated or, um, yeah, reactivated upon injury, used on injury as an opportunity to try to repair upon injury. And maybe that's why it's evolutionarily conserved. And finally, I uh, just want to thank the people who have done this work. So Rachel was a PhD student working on the embryonic side of this glia, um, Neil, Kentaro, and Maria on the larva. And uh, this was the, Manuel was an engineer postdoc who wrote all the programs for us, and we still collaborate very much with him. And the work in the mouse was done in collaboration with Dan Logan um, in Birmingham and Fumio Matsutsaki in Riken uh, in the mouse, and we're currently also collaborating with Ben Alderson. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>